my fellow filtrate, uh, Dr. Jenny Lin from Northwestern University in Chicago for today's uh, nephrology grand rounds. Uh, Dr. Lin um, has been uh, a scientist right from the start, uh, studying genotype phenotype relationships as an undergrad uh, at Harvard. Uh, and then she went on to do her med school at Houston, uh, her uh, internal medicine residency at Colorado before going to UPenn for nephrology fellowship. Uh, that's where she did um, a research training in cardiovascular labs that emphasize genetics, genomics and uh, genome editing. Uh, and that's what we will be talking about today, uh, not getting lost in translation, uh, new frontiers in kidneyomics. Uh, welcome, Jenny. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation, Swapnil. I'm delighted to be here today. Um, so as, as Swapna was saying, I'm a physician scientist and I'm at Northwestern University. I started my lab there at the very beginning of 2018 in the middle of a polar vortex <laughs> when I moved. And I'm sure those of you in Canada don't think that's a big deal, but as a native Texan, <laughs> it was definitely um, a big change for me. But I'm delighted to now have a graduate student and a couple of people working in my lab, which focuses on functional genomics. And so one of the things about functional genomics is that it's really unique in trying to merge genetics uh, and unbiased data from humans, uh, patients, and also mouse models and other animal models, and tries to uh, bring mechanism to what we are discovering at the bedside. And hopefully you know, in that uh, kind of present some candidates to go back into the therapeutic pipeline. So as a physician and a, a clinical nephrologist on the adult side, that has been a passion of mine in terms of um, trying to move the kidney field forward. Uh, these are my disclosures. So uh, my first, the fr very first grand rounds I ever gave was at the University of Pennsylvania where I did my uh, nephrology fellowship. And my first presentation there was in 2016, no, 2014, I believe. Um, and we as fellows were paired with senior faculty members to put together uh, our first grand rounds talk just so that they wanted to make sure that we knew what we were doing if we were to ever give a talk like this uh, somewhere else. And uh, Dr. Stan Goldfarb, who is a master clinician educator, was my assigned grand rounds mentor. And to his horror, I had decided to present on a scientific topic as opposed to a clinical topic that could be really rooted in a very clear case you could bring uh, from the wards or from clinic. And so he furrowed his eyebrows at me and said, you know, um, with grand rounds, people kind of go to it every week with the expectation that it follows a certain structure. So it's kind of like an opera, so to speak. And he said, no matter what, whether or not it's a basic science-based uh, presentation or it's one that's talking about clinical practice, you should always begin with the patient front and center on stage. And so ever since then, I have been doing that regardless of the topic. And so today, it's gonna be a little bit uh, different from a typical clinical case presentation in the sense that I'm gonna be asking you uh, not to necessarily review an actual case with me, but to think about a potential case in the future. So projecting forward and trying to think about this, you know, what I like to do as a scientist is think about how can we make clinical practice better? And you know, this is looking, projecting way into the future because when you're doing uh, mechanistic work, whatever you're doing there uh, doesn't necessarily make it into clinic until many, many years later, although hopefully that will get better as our technology improves. And so you know, thinking 20 years from now, what would nephrology clinic look like um, for those of us who are not gonna be retired on the beach in Fiji, <laughs> but for those of us who are still you know, needing to bring, bring home the bacon to our families, et cetera, you know, how, how would that look like? and what would we be, what would it look like with our trainees? So thinking as you know, a physician scientist and something that I've been passionate about, I would love to see a day when outpatient dialysis is no longer needed. And the reason of that is because outpatient dialysis does not exist. Uh, this, uh, I presented a similar type of future projected uh, clinical scenario, again, in front of Dr. Goldfarb and the UPenn faculty. And this 
did not elicit a very positive response. Uh, some of the faculty members said, wait, so you're, you want us to not exist as a specialty anymore? I'm like, no, 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 no. It just changes how we would look at nephrology practice, right? Um, you know, and maybe what we would be doing, uh, we would all be in some way some element of a transplant nephrologist because perhaps we can grow kidneys from people's own white blood cells um, that get reprogrammed into stem cells and then grown into organs that actually work. Uh, this is very, very far from actual clinical translation, but it's something that people are really working hard on in regenerative medicine. And if we are giving more simple pills that we are still using in today's toolbox, maybe that's for people who opt out of the uh, you know, genomic type of uh, workup and they don't want to actually be genetically tested to see what their risk factors are and whether or not they actually need to have any preventative therapies or if they need to you know, actually undergo genome editing to make sure that whatever you know, autologous kidney transplant would actually uh, not fail uh, in the future. So what I would like to see is current nephrology practice somehow becoming obsolete in 20 years. And I think as a physician scientist, our goal is to put ourselves out of business, at least the current business model. And you know, thinking about things that we currently prescribe like cytoxan or putting people on machines several times a week. And just thinking about how these tools are quite blunt in some ways and they're not very precise. Um, and that we could maybe hopefully in 20 years be doing things um, and offering our patients uh, definitely more precise therapies that can also be preventative so that we would never need outpatient dialysis again. And so, you know, I've already asked you to go come with me to what I like to call imagination station. And, uh, you know, so if that's the case, how would we go about getting there? So if we don't have outpatient dialysis, what would our clinic visits really look like? And so I like to think about uh, this a triangle of clinical translation where some of the workflow and solutions that we come up with are really based on discovery from the patient. Uh, coming down into scientific mechanistic work that then allows us to develop therapies that go back to the patient. And in a world of genomics, this could look like uh, what I'm about to say or present here. And this is a hypothetical. Not everyone in the field agrees that this is a direction that we're going, but just want to get you thinking about this and uh, the topics that I'm going to cover during the next hour are going to uh, be related to some of these concepts. So if you think about, you know, I'm an adult nephrologist, but maybe in 20 years, some of the patients I'll be seeing are actually pediatric because if we are doing genetic screenings um, in a more uh, sophisticated way, perhaps there is a role for risk prediction. And as one way we would go through, go through that is by whole genome sequencing. Right now, uh, I know that that is uh, available for uh, pediatric uh, cases. Um, but we would be able to detect certain DNA variants that might increase people's risk for kidney disease and other complex traits. Um, and certainly it can pick up on any uh, Mendelian diseases as well. But also from the patient, uh, we can collect, uh, as I said, peripheral blood cells, uh, cells shed by the kidney, even skin biopsies, and take those cells and reprogram them with uh, these, uh, what we call Yamanaka factors, into uh, induced pluripotent stem cells where uh, they really are de-differentiated from any terminal state and can be reprogrammed into or re-differentiated into an end organ or a different cell type, depending on uh, the protocols you follow. Uh, but before doing anything with that, uh, based on the data that we get from a person's genome, we could employ genome editing or CRISPR to see if there are DNA variants that we would want to correct back from a minor allele um, to the major or what we would call a healthy variant. And then do that in the stem cells that could then uh, be engineered or undergo differentiation into engineered kitties that could then go back into the patient. So this could be uh, a very broad, uh, very futuristic, future forward looking uh, big picture. Another uh, route that is probably a little bit more um, 
I guess, uh, close to us in the pipeline is developing a polygenic risk score based on someone's uh, genomic information, and then forming tailored preventative pharmacologic therapies for seeing, um, you know, who would be at highest risk and who might need, you know, the SGLT2 inhibitor a little bit early, who needs earlier screening, who might need to get their blood drawn more frequently to predict whether or not they're going to need some sort of intervention early on. So this is kind of, you know, how I might envision a possibility, uh, maybe not in 20 years, but hopefully sometime in my lifetime. Um, but again, a lot of what we're doing at the bench um, is geared towards seeing if something like this could happen. So the objectives of today is not necessarily to get into the nitty gritty about how we would translate all of that, but to really present to you all these tools that are available that kind of fit into that picture, uh, whether or not that's for discovery or whether or not there is potential future clinical translational use. Um, understanding that if we are thinking about clinical translation, what would those barriers be in kidney genomics? And then recognize future direct directions that could be informative for therapeutics. So I'm not going to be dividing the talk into these three topic areas, but these are objectives to think about as I'm going through the different concepts and technologies that people are working on today. So I'm first going to start from this uh, patient to, uh, so the uh, bedside to bench translation aspect, where we're taking information that we could get from patients and seeing how that might inform future uh, bench experiments and what we're doing to discover mechanisms of kidney disease. And this would hopefully would, you know, end with the goal of identifying new and novel therapeutic targets. So two areas I wanted to talk to you all about are uh, you know, genetic studies where we can get genetic information from whole genome sequencing or from what we call SNP chip genotyping. And then the other is looking at the RNA uh, in patient materials that can be um, leveraged. And we have some new technologies here that are uh, particularly exciting for the kidney, which is such a complex organ with many different cell types. And we can get more information from transcriptomics based on single cell and spatial transcriptomic technologies. So, you know, why genetics? Why do we care about uh, doing, uh, trying to get information from each patient's genome? Uh, what we have discovered is a lot of complex traits actually are heritable. They, you can see that diabetes runs in family, kidney disease sometimes runs in families, even though they may not be directly related to what we call Mendelian traits, where there's a large, you don't necessarily need to have um, you know, a deleterious mutation in the NPHS1 gene to have proteinuria, for example, but you could have uh, many different uh, variants of, that exert small effects that can still lead to kidney damage. And uh, what we have been doing in the field uh, when you can recruit uh, large numbers of patients and also healthy controls is if you genotype them, whether that's through whole genome sequencing more likely you're doing this on some sort of SNP array or SNP chip. Uh, you can look at patients versus controls and see which uh, DNA variants are overrepresented and associated uh, with a specific trait. And uh, after, you know, when you do that statistically with Bonf a very strict Bonferroni correction and other ways to account for uh, multiple testing, uh, you end up with a list of candidate variants that may be associated with a particular trait that you're looking for. And these traits, um, again, they're complex, so they are uh, usually influenced by many different DNA variants that exert small effects. So you can get, end up generating long lists, and be, they're not necessarily assigned to any particular patient, but one patient may have you know, a few different variants that are in these studies, and you can generate what we call a polygenic risk score to see what their risk of actually developing disease is in the future or whether or not their disease actually um, lines up mathematically with the probability of doing so. And so in other fields, especially in cardiovascular um, biology and science, this has been going on for quite a long time in terms of identifying potential novel loci or areas of, of the genome that present um, candidates for further study. And so usually you end up with lists of hundreds of genes or 
what we call loci, um, even though we may not know what the causal gene is, and I'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, and so since that time, since a lot of uh, these studies have, were first published over a decade ago, there have been a lot of mechanistic studies looking at traits like LDL cholesterol, um, diabetes, atherosclerosis, myocardial infarction. And in the kidney field, uh, we also have been having GWAS studies. And I'm presenting you know, a summary, a figure from one of the largest ones most recently in 2019 that also incorporated data from the Million Veterans Program in the US. So they ended up having a very well-powered study to identify over 300 genomic loci that associated with EGFR. Um, and we'll come back to this a little bit about whether or not EGFR is really a trait that we should be looking at. Uh, but probably more uh, compelling would be uh, a genome-wide study that was done in African ancestry patients in 2010 that ended up identifying APOL1 as a risk, risk locus for uh, FSGS and proteinuric kidney disease in patients of African ancestry. So in the kidney field, we definitely have candidates that are being uh, worked up. So as I had mentioned before, from these genome-wide association studies, you can end up with very, very long lists. Like I ended up pulling the supplemental study from that 2019 paper, and they, it's an Excel file, and you can scroll down, and there are like hundreds and hundreds of uh, variants listed. And when you're trying to interpret what does this mean when you have this list, there are some caveats to look at when you're thinking about mechanistic studies and trying to figure out which of these variants are potential uh, candidates to look at for future therapies. Um, so one is that the reported variant, so on this list, so say this one for AK6, uh, this is the closest gene, but a lot of these variants tend to be in non-coding regions, so intergenic regions between uh, genes, or they may actually be located in the intron intronic regions, so between exons, but we don't actually know whether or not those variants are actually the causal variants. And this is because uh, on these chips, you can have a lead variant that's reported, but the lead variant may actually be in high linkage disequilibrium with many other variants close by. Um, and some of that is based uh, on power to detect, uh, but you can have a whole host of other candidates that may also not be listed on the chip, and they could potentially be the ones that are causal, but because they are inherited at a high rate with this lead variant, the lead variant is what ends up getting reported. So you, uh, bioinformatically, uh, people have been doing a fine mapping to try to identify a lot of these uh, linked variants, but you can also take some of that information and do testing to see whether or not if you um, introduce these variants into a cell, whether or not that actually affects anything like gene expression of nearby genes. Another uh, caveat to consider is that the causal gene affected by the variant may not actually be the one in closest proximity. So for this variant here, this is the RS number that identifies the variant. This is the actual position in the genome. And they're saying the closest gene is AK6, but we don't know if that's actually the causal gene that's doing anything to kidney function. And the reason for this is, as I mentioned before, a lot of the variants that we see on GWAS are in non-coding regions, and they are linked together. But uh, the one that may be causal could be the one that actually affects transcription of another gene. And that uh, variant could be located far away, but comes close to the gene because of uh, looping, uh, promotin looping that allows for transcription. So this is part of the transcriptional regu regulatory machine. And so you can have something that's many, many, many bases away, uh, but still is causal. And again, you may end up skipping a gene, or it could be a, the neighboring gene that's actually further away in terms of actual uh, distance. So uh, having it, calling it right next to the variant that doesn't necessarily inform us of whether or not that particular gene is doing anything, but it gives us a location to start probing. Um, the causal effects of the called variant uh, may also be specific to cell type. So if we look at AK6, this uh, particular variant, uh, 
um, it may exert different effects on in podocytes versus in the proximal tubular cell versus in an endothelial cell. And that may also speak to mechanism. And so uh, Callan Shustak had done a very elegant study where she ended up micro dissecting um, tubules and glomeruli, uh, ended up with uh, you know, RNA sequencing uh, gene expression profiles from them. Uh, but she was also able to determine whether or not the presence or absence of a called variant ended up affecting gene expression um, of a candidate gene. And so she had two candidates for one particular variant, DAB2 and C9. You can see that the variant is in between the two of them. Uh, but through very careful testing, she was able to determine that, um, so these plots are based on genotypes. So they say this is you know, the major, two major alleles, you know, major, minor, and two minor alleles. The expression of this gene is plotted on this graph. And you can see that for C9, Regardless of the genotype, there's no change in expression, but there is change in expression for DAB2, but it's specific to the tubules. So the glomerular component didn't have any changes, but the tubule did. And some of the, um, what we call expression quantitative trait loci experiments that look at this in whole kidney tissue may obscure some of the signals because we're looking at whole tissue profiles and not cell specific or compartment specific. So. This was actually a very um, important paper to let us know that we have to look at um, expression in more detail. If we want to see whether or not there are actual potential causal effects of variants that we uh, that associate with traits like EGFR or CKD in these larger observational genetic studies. And then she also very elegantly demonstrated uh, through mouse studies, once she had these candidates, uh, that there was um, a fibrosis phenotype looking at uh, DAB2. And the final thing to consider, as I mentioned, and I had asked uh, kind of a rhetorical question, whether or not EGFR is a good phenotype to have in these genetic studies. So not going into you know, race-based EGFR equations or anything like that, but just thinking about EGFR in general, um, it's not necessarily the best phenotype based on calculations. Um, so many variables affect it, and um, it is a longitude, you know, a continuous variable. So depending on your calculations and where you're capturing it in time, um, it may not necessarily be as strong as a phenotype such as the presence or absence of kidney disease. Um, kind of like, you know, with the atherosclerosis uh, community, whether or not you have an MI or not MI as the phenotype, right, you can end up with very strong signals. So out of the 300 loci that were called by that paper, how many of them are true signals versus, you know, you're picking up some fluctuations um, from EGFR. So uh, there's the adage like garbage in equals garbage out. So if you have weak phenotypes going in, you may have weak results coming out. And that's just something to think about as we look forward to potentially uh, designing future uh, kidney genetic studies. So th uh, that's what I have to say about genetic studies. Uh, we can also get information from patients based on looking at their RNA profile. And so as I mentioned, uh, transcriptomics is really the study of RNA expression within a sample, whether that's whole tissue or single cells. And looking back uh, in time, uh, we've done transcriptomics in different ways. The old school way when I was an undergraduate studying fish was doing this by microarray, so we call this chips, where you have different uh, you know, genes uh, on a chip and you can, through hybridization, see whether or not there are uh, changes in abundance of expression that would basically be detected uh, by a fluorescent array. And uh, the lab I was in in undergrad was working on microarrays and because we were a fish lab, our lab t-shirt said fish and chips. <laughs> so that was a lot of fun. But again, that's from uh, 2002, 2003, uh, when this was really like considered uh, cutting edge technology. And then when I was in fellowship, people were really excited because we had a new technology that was uh, getting more and more uh, common to use called next generation sequencing. 
next generation sequencing mainly refers to this process by which you can sequence and read this uh, actual nucleotides um, in a massively parallel fashion. So there's still, you know, I wouldn't call it a chip, it's called a flow cell. Um, there are adapters down here that then allow, when you make a, DNA, uh, a sequencing library here, to say, we'll just go back. If you process a sample, get their RNA, you can make what we call a library where attached to these RNA samples that are um, made into complementary DNA, you can attach these adapters, and then these adapters kind of hybridize to these adapters that allow for them to stick down. And what happens um, in next generation sequencing is we have a flow cell where you can capture, you know, millions, millions and hundreds of millions of these different transcripts and different abundance. Uh, it takes time for them to look at the fluorophores attached to each nucleotide. And you're taking a picture and based on every single level, it's basically capturing the color data that then gets, uh, uh, I guess, translated over into nucleotide data. And what's cool about this is that it's unbiased, so you can have any sort of transcripts. That So if those transcripts were not predicted on this chip, they would be captured here. And you can uh, control the depth of sequence, and you have a lot more flexibility in this um, type of technology. And what that allows for is also you know, detection of you know, novel alternative splicing events, uh, different um, abundance that is a little bit more quantitative than what you would see on a microarray. So this was really exciting and I presented on this as a nephrology fellow, um, but little did I know that once I had mastered the concept of this, there was a whole other <laughs> technology being developed um, in the single cell realm that you would have to learn things all over again. And that's one of the exciting things about science is that you're always kept on your toes. Um, but prior to that, so again, uh, looking at what we can find in terms of information from these types of transcriptomic studies, um, this was from 2002, talking about microarray and Kidney International and the hope behind it. Uh, a couple years later, a New England Journal article looking at molecular profiling using microarray technology to identify the molecular signatures and allograph rejection. And then even all the way into like 2015 or so, still doing um, RNA sequencing, the massively parallel next generation sequencing to look at just very carefully profile different injury models uh, using acute kidney injury to identify transcriptional signatures. So this has done a lot in terms of allowing us to glean unbiased data um, from patients and animal models. So with, if we were doing so well with that, why did people even bother creating this crazy single cell technology? Um, so Catelyn Schustuck had posed this question at Kidney Week uh, a few years ago uh, that I thought was very clever and kind of illustrates some of the limitations of doing whole, grinding up whole tissue and trying to glean a transcriptomic profiles. You can still see a lot of information but unless you're micro dissecting the kidney and separating the glomeruli and the tubules, uh, you're going to be getting very um, blunted information. So she had asked the Kidney Week audience, the average salary of a geography major graduating from the University of North Carolina was 100 grand in the 1980s. And why is that? And I, first of all, I didn't know that geography was actually a major <laughs> that you could do in college. Uh, but yeah, 100 grand, that's pretty good, especially in the 80s. So how did that happen? What kind of career could you have from it? Well, it turns out that this was you know, a, a mean salary and that there was someone who was dragging up the mean. So maybe most of the people who were geography graduates had the salaries that you kind of expect. Uh, but who's this person over here? Well, it turns out it was actually Michael Jordan, right? making only multi, however millions of dollars he was making. And you know, this actually skewed the data, right? Like you're not necessarily getting an accurate representation of what life would be like after college as a geography major if Michael Jordan is somehow um, contributing to that data. And so uh, when we're thinking about this, 
what I presented to you with microarray and what we call bulk RNA sequencing, you get the final product that you get in your data looks like a smoothie. So let's say this is a kidney smoothie, it'll be different from a heart smoothie for sure, but you're not seeing all the different components that are going into it, where a single cell RNA sequencing allows you to see all the ingredients in what abundance, so how many strawberries there are, et cetera, what the strawberries may have looked like, and oh look, we can actually identify who Michael Jordan is in this movie. So that's one of the powers of single cell RNA sequencing. And how this works, I'm not gonna get into all the, there are a few different platforms that allow this technology to happen. Uh, this is just a very, very general overview of what 10X technology is. So this is probably one of the more commonly used technologies because it is more user friendly. Uh, where we have this, what we call controller or what we call a toaster box uh, that does the microfluidics and the library generation. So say if you have um, a piece of kidney biopsy or you have a mouse kidney or any other animal kidney, what you first have to do is get them into single cell uh, suspension. So you do that through enzymatic dissociation this step actually introduces some technical variation and uh, requires a lot of technical expertise to optimize so that you're not having a lot of cells die during this process. The same you get a very good quality suspension. Uh, these cells, uh, they're put on a chip and then they go into this microfluidic system where they are literally shot into these gel beads. And so the hope is by doing this at the correct rate and flow and pressure that you're getting one cell per bead. You may have some empty beads, maybe a few cells might have two, two beads might have two cells, but for the most part, what you're hoping to get is one cell per bead. And in here, you end up having barcodes uh, to create libraries, but you're doing this within each uh, gel bead separately. And that's how you're able to capture cell by cell. And then when you have these uh, barcoded DNA libraries uh, done, that goes back into the massively parallel sequencing platform that I had shown you before. You just don't have to get as many reads because each cell doesn't have as much RNA. And so the type of data that you get coming out of this, uh, you can see is you have your all your smoothie ingredients here. So this is called a TCNE plot. Uh, this is from Callis Shustuck's landmark study in science uh, this journal Science in 2018, where she did this for mouse kidneys. And you can see number three, this is proximal tubule. You have the accurate representation that this composes, comprises a huge part of the cells in the kidneys. And you have all these different cell types, endothelial cells, polocytes, loop of Henle, distal collecting gut, even fibroblasts, macrophages, all these immune cells, what she calls novel one and novel two, uh, potential transitional cell types in the uh, distal tubule. Um, but on this TCNE plot, what it's showing is basically a calculated probability of the distance each cell has from each other. And so although these are called proximal tubular cells, we're calling it by probability and by looking at the expression of certain marker genes. So this is a violin plot of marker genes uh, where uh, you know, you have UMOD here, LRP2, um, here are the glomerular, glomerular ones, NPHS1, NPHS2, where you can see that the expression is very, very specific to, you know, a particular cluster. For the podocytes, because there are not as many captured, it's harder to capture podocytes. It's in this cluster two over here, and then three LRP2, and then SLC2782, these are marker genes for the proximal tubule. And again, you don't necessarily see this in the podocytes and other uh, cell types represented by all these clusters down here. So this is a good uh, overview plot. And then this kind of is the argument for why you're calling certain, how you're labeling each cluster and calling cell types. Uh, but again, these are probabilities. Uh, they are not 100% a slam dunk, so you'll always need, especially if you're calling a novel cell type, you will always need in vivo validation, whether or not that is, you know, through some sort of IHC with patient samples or through, you know, looking at expression under the microscope in a mouse. And so uh, this, uh, they took a portion of this plot here, so you can see they took kind of blowing this up, 
And uh, what you're seeing in red here is the expression of certain marker genes. So you can see that they're very specific to the clusters. And what they're arguing is that there is potentially a transitional cell type in the distal tubule. So you can kind of look at even novel cell states or uh, disease cell states uh, when you're able to profile in this way that you cannot see through bulk RNA sequencing and certainly not through microarray. Um, I don't have time to go through all of the different types of studies that, um, or not all the different types, but the different landmark studies in the kidney field, uh, but I'll just highlight a couple to give you a sense for what types of data you can expect. So uh, uh, Rafe Kramen's group in Germany did this very cool um, study looking at samples from human kidneys to try to see what are the origins of myofibroblasts. And uh, he was able to identify, his group was able to identify specific subpopulation of cells from which these myofibroblasts grow. And uh, also detected that fibro, certain fibroblasts and myofibroblast cell states actually also have different gene regulatory programs. And that was only be picked up on single cell RNA sequencing. They also identified a potential gene target uh, specific to the myofibroblasts that could represent a potential uh, target for small um, molecule compounds in the future. So this is a very cool proof of uh, concept, proof of principle uh, study. Another is you know, also taking patient material is to look at what, you know, what, what the immune cells in the kidneys of patients with lupus nephritis might look like. So they did this um, with patient biopsies versus healthy controls and identified 21 subsets of leukocytes active in disease, which I find pretty amazing. They were able to identify B cell signatures and also different states of monocyte differentiation at a resolution that is kind of unprecedented. And another important thing that they had gleaned from this was that immune cells they collected from the urine also had gene expression profiles that correlated with very specific leukocyte gene expression profiles in the kidney, again, identified by single cell. So the hope is that if there's, this is validated, that maybe instead of doing serial kidney biopsies, we may have um, some information and data for identifying non-invasive biomarkers through urine studies. But that's you know, pretty cool in terms of kidney translation. And the next step up from that is uh, looking at spatial transcriptomics, which at this time, uh, based on where we are in technology, we don't have this at single cell resolution. But um, what we can glean from it is uh, the preservation of the architecture of the kidney microenvironment, where you have embedded tissue. So say if you, you know, collect a mouse tissue and you embed it on these slides, uh, you can see you know, where these cells are and what types of cells they are, maybe certain transcripts are activated, but you see it in exactly where they are in space. So there are leukocytes infiltrating during rejection or an ischemic injury. You can capture that data here rather than in single cell sequencing where you might see an increase in the leukocyte um, population, but you won't see exactly where they are on the cell. And so they have, again, it's kind of like the microarray concept, these, bar, uh, these spots that then get capture um, transcripts, except what is different about this is that you're putting this actual tissue on. And so you're able to see um, in like a small area that has um, you know, multiple cells, what the transcriptional profile is. And um, this is a recent paper from 2021 looking at ischemia injury reperfusion kidneys where you were able to see leukocyte infiltration here with these green cells. So this is uh, the sham control. These, these are the mouse kidneys that underwent the uh, procedure. And overlaying that, they saw a lot of expression in the leukocytes of this gene ATF3, which is involved in ER stress. So again, being able to identify other candidate genes through this type of technology. You can see like all these little spots. You can kind of see, you can still see the different zones of the kidney, but again, it's not quite at the single cell resolution. So just with any technology, there are caveats to consider. A depth of data is limited, both on the single cell side, but also on the uh, spatial side. And so there are some things that we cannot capture, like alternative splicing events. We may not also capture some of the lower expression transcripts, like non-coding transcripts that do play important roles in the cell. As I mentioned before, there are 
areas in the workflow where a lot of technical variation can be introduced. And this needs to be taken into consideration when you're reading through the methods um, and looking at studies with that may have the same experimental setup or same patient population, but very different results. And then with anything, you always need biological validation. So the computer may spit out these really, really pretty graphs. Uh, but again, unless you can validate it, we don't really know if it's true. Um, so in the last 15 minutes, hopefully I can go through this a little bit more quickly, uh, thinking about uh, well, once both at the bench and therapeutics, how we can leverage these technologies, genome editing and regenerative medicine through kidney organ lights um, as potential um, future directions. So um, I'm not sure how familiar all of you are with genome editing. I know you know that it exists, but in terms of exactly how it works, um, I was going to go through some of that here, especially for any trainees in the audience. Um, this is something that is being taught in some high schools now, and Hollywood has picked it up <laughs> for TV shows and movies. So uh, it's always a good thing to know how it really works so that we can always say, no, Jennifer Lopez, your show is full of crap, right? Um, and it also is something that if we're thinking about it therapeutically, would be also good to explain to patients. So um, human genome has you know, many, 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 many nucleotides. And you think about it, the genetic information that's stored in that is kind of like this library. And what genome editing does is that you are taking um, a, you know, words from this library and just literally editing it, just changing it in a very, very specific spot. And so to help explain this, um, I had done this at Penn with Dr. Sidney Cobran, who we had always known to be uh, very good at explaining things um, to patients uh, with his famous kidney book. And so I, was, so I basically made him do a very similar exercise in trying to explain genome editing. Um, so when you're trying to do genome editing through CRISPR or any other um, older technologies, what you're trying to do is identify a very specific area in the genome to be edited. And so we have this target site here. And when you identify that site, uh, what you want to do is create some sort of break, whether it's double-stranded, the traditional way is to do it, a double-stranded break, or you could do a single-strand break. And we do this through a nuclease. So here he's cutting the DNA at a very specific site. And what happens at this point is how you allow the cell to, to repair itself. So the cell is not gonna allow DNA to be you know, flapping broken. So it's going to immediately try to repair it. And the type of edit you make depends on whether or not you let the cell do it on its own or whether or not you introduce a template. And based on that, you'll have some sort of change here. Hopefully it's a change that you are hoping for. And so uh, this actually came about, you know, the idea of genome editing had, is not novel in terms of CRISPR, but what CRISPR does is it allows for user-friendly and scalable uh, system that's relatively cheap to engineer. So whereas this Talens assay down here probably could take months to design just to make one edit, uh, for CRISPR, my graduate student can today uh, design, go through a computational tool, design a very specific um, pro, uh, protospacer that she wants to introduce, order the primer, it can be shipped out tonight, we receive it tomorrow morning, and then we can start to introduce it into our cell cultures whenever our cell cultures are ready. So it's very, very user friendly. And because of this, it's been revolutionizing uh, what we do at the bench. And uh, these two um, powerhouses, uh, Dr. Charpentier and Dr. Downa, recently won a Nobel Prize for their work in hacking genome editing to make it uh, this uh, available to scientists widely. And they did this by looking at how CRISPR works in bacteria. So if you think about what CRISPR does in a bacterial cell, it is basically the immune system of a bacterial cell that's trying to resist viral invasion. So if you think about the virus as an antigen, so it's viral RNA coming in, uh, what the bacterial cell does is it keeps its vaccination record, and that's the CRISPR part. It's clustered regular, regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. And it takes these sequences and it has them stored so that 
this, uh, what we call an antibody um, in the eukaryotic system is formed and can then identify the RNA to be shredded up. And that's what the Cas nuclease here does. And so what uh, Dowden and Charpentier did was they hacked it so that you can you know, introduce a Cas nuclease into a eukaryotic cell, but also use a structure of the um, tracer RNA that's used to identify the uh, viral RNA, but use it for our DNA and basically hack it so that we can then edit our own genomes. And as I was showing you through Dr. Coburn's uh, photos, how you repair this break that the nuclease, Cas9 nuclease actually makes determines the type of um, repair and what you do to the genome. So if you just let it repair itself, you probably can knock out the cell because it repairs um, imprecisely causing a frame shift. Or uh, what my lab had done was use homology-directed repair to introduce DNA variants. And so we did this with ABLE all one uh, some of the limitations is off-target effects um, that would be pre that could prevent a larger scale clinical translation because you definitely don't want to have off-target effects that are deleterious, so it has to undergo very careful screening, and also the efficiency of editing is low. Um, I'll skip base editing for now and go on to, um, so in 2021, uh, th these are pu published uh, uh, small trials of uh, CRISPR-Cas9 editing for uh, sickle cell disease with thalassemia, which is really cool. Uh, the outcome from these patients is that when their uh, blood cells were edited and reintroduced, uh, they were able to have a stable correction of their variants, but also they were no longer transfusion dependent and no longer were having pain crises, and that's huge. That is a win. And then also for uh, ATTR amyloidosis, they were able to uh, knock out the protein and reduce its amount. So again, um, I don't remember if they had lo uh, very long longitudinal data, but certainly this is something that could be potentially very useful um, in preventing disease. So that's kind of proof of concept in other uh, specialties, although I know sickle cell, uh, we do interface with uh, as nephrologists. So, uh, what are some missing links? Um, well, I'll kind of show you uh, through my work in APOL1 uh, where we are in terms of looking at the bench and uh, some of the challenges there. So um, for this audience, I won't get go too much into uh, what APOL1 is, uh, but knowing that the G1 and G2 variants are the risk alleles associated with APOL1 nephropathy in people of African ancestry, and we have these different uh, clinical phenotypes. Uh, we know from high van and also from COVID-19 nephropathy in people with these risk variants, uh, equal one disease can be brought on through interferon uh, induction and exposure. And so one of the reasons I wanted to look at genome editing for equal one is that uh, equal one nephropathy is specific to primates uh, because equal one is not expressed in mice. So when we're thinking about model systems, people have been introducing parts of the equal one protein um, into mice, but again, what we're missing is some of the very human-specific regulatory elements uh, that we can only glean from human cells. So I wanted to do this in human-induced uh, pluripotent stem cells. Uh, we are trying to also, um, ideally, we are trying to also recruit uh, patients with the risk alleles and correct their variants back to the G0, uh, differentiating the iPSCs and the kidney organoids, and then using single cell RNA sequencing to see what we can glean after we induce equal one expression with interferon and expose it to an additional hit or stressor through ER stress. Um, so in the interest of time, I won't go into too much of the technical details. Uh, my grad student have published this in Kidney360 uh, in 2020 if you want to look at it in more uh, detail. But basically, we were able to knock in the G1 variants, uh, we're currently working on doing the G2s, um, use a very an antibiotic related selection process and was able to remove the selection cassette in a way that did not disrupt the amino acid sequence. So this is what we call footprint free genome editing. And we did this through kind of a, a biochemistry hack that I will also skip in the interest of time. Um, and from that, what we did was we uh, 
differentiated our genome edited stem cells into organoids. Uh, and uh, organoids, I think in the, around two, 2015 was when they were really starting to get published in the kidney field. And we use the Friedman protocol and collaborating with Bino Friedman in Seattle to do this, where you basically have stem cells, say at D, day zero, uh, that get differentiated capitated spheroids. We then try to turn it into a mesoderma, mesoderm phenotype into this mesenchyme and then go uh, create these tubular organoids. So this is from his uh, seminal 2015 paper. This is a cartoon representing kind of the immature format of these little mini nephrons we get in these, what we call like these little globs in the dish. And you can see product cell, it's a marker for the glomerulus, LTL, or, uh, proximal tubule, and that they are present uh, in this example of organoid. Again, here's one with the glomer glomerular-like uh, structure up close. And again, these are not vascularized, so they're very uh, immature embryonically, Equate, basically um, equating to about first trimester kidney. And this is uh, what we did in our lab using that same protocol. We were able to get uh, organoids that were to mature to our liking by day 30. And, um, and what the Friedman group did as proof of principle to say that this could model disease was they knocked out the PKD genes uh, in their stem cells and were able to grow cysts in the dish, which is really, really cool. Um, so we did something similar, not growing cysts, but we did the similar protocol uh, with our G0, G1, ABOL1 stem cells. And what we found uh, was that structurally, I mean, even though, yes, by the eye, that they look a little bit different, but all the marker genes are there and they're exactly where they're supposed to be. So no big differences in G0 and G1 organoids. When you hit them with interferon to induce APOL1, because at baseline, they don't express it in terms of protein or RNA. Uh, interferon is able to turn on APOL1 expression. Uh, we ended up hitting the organoids with a second insult, which is ER stress induced by tunica myosin. And when we did this, you can see, for example, this marker gene here for a glomerular epithelial cell for G1 in red. When you add the tunica myosin, you have a lot less expression of it. So indicating that there's probably a lot more dedifferentiation or loss of this more mature glomerular epithelial cell phenotype. So just kind of showing us proof of principle that this uh, type of model system can model ApoA1 disease, especially if we're able to figure out how to vascularize these organoids in the future. Um, in terms of COVID-19 associated injury, organoids were used once again for some discovery work. Uh, what the Kramen group did in Germany was they found autopsy uh, samples uh, of kidneys from COVID-19 patients and then those without any history of CKD found that they had a lot of collagen and a lot of fibrosis. This is a CKD control. The collagen is in red. And what they found also was that the SARS-CoV-2 genome was identified in podocytes and proximal tubular cells of organoids hit with the virus. So there was kind of some debate about whether or not there's direct interaction with um, the virus in these cells. Uh, potentially, if they actually get through the filtration barrier, yes, the, they can infect kidney-like cells. And so what they did here to prove um, that there's some something going on in the kidney direct, directly related to the virus and not just a bystander of immune cell activation and cytokines from nearby immune cells, they took these organoids that you see here. Here's a control. Organoids exp exposed to the COVID-2 virus ended up producing a lot of collagen in the organoid. And this was rescued through an antiviral um, inhibitor. Um, you can also use organoids to screen for drug toxicity. So this is uh, from Friedman's group looking at high throughput screening where you can have 384 wells, uh, all with different organoids in it, potentially from different patients. Um, and you hit them with cisplatin, which we know is toxic to the kidneys. And you can see that there is basically a loss of uh, the structural integrity of the organoids hit with cisplatin and an increase in KIM-1 expression, which is a proximal tubular injury marker that you may recognize through AKI. So again, here are some potential uh, uses for clinical translation now uh, that don't involve regrowing a whole kidney, um, but it's still relevant. 
Um, and one of the reasons that we're not quite there yet in terms of growing our own kidney, so say if, say we were able to uh, take a patient that has the ApoL1 risk alleles and change them into G0, we're not quite at the point where we're able to do much in terms of growing the kidney because uh, we haven't properly vascularized them, and that is part of the barrier to forming more mature organoids. And so here we see these, um, you know, that's a huge barrier for the glomerulus and also uh, further differentiation. Uh, we still have some off-target cells being grown in these organoids, so we don't know what the implication of that is. Uh, having muscle cells grow in the middle of your kidney might be a little bit strange. Uh, some people are trying to uh, offset this by implanting uh, young organoids into mouse kidneys to see if the microenvironment of the kidney will help. And it does to some degree, but again, we're not at that point of injecting it into humans. Um, an organoid is very, very small. So if you're thinking about the amount we're going to have to filter uh, after vascularization, you may need, um, you know, I don't know how many of these organoids, like thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of organoids, I don't know, in a bag or something to create um, these nephrons. Uh, so Melissa Little's group is trying to scale this up to see like, okay, if you do bioprinting, can you also scale up the number and have that as a solution for handling the filtration burden of an adult? Um, and again, reproducibility, organoids can differ from batch to batch. So that's also a quality control issue. Um, but despite all of these, we still have a really cool tool to use uh, for screening purposes. So like the drug toxicity thing, I think is a very real um, solution to identifying which patients may be at risk of AKI, say from chemotherapeutic agents or if there are cardiovascular agents you wanted to introduce but wanted to kind of risk, uh, kind of risk stratify uh, uh, kidney injury. Um, and then also looking at things like when we have a pandemic and a novel virus, what are the effects on the kidney? We'll just grow in addition, let's see. So lots of really cool tools and maybe hopefully sometime in our lifetime, we can actually grow a real kidney from this technology when it advances. Uh, so this, that's what I have. This is my lab and um, a lot of different collaborators and mentors from the past. And I know we're out of time, but I'm also open for questions if people wanted to stick around for a couple of minutes. Thanks, uh, thanks Jenny. That was a fantastic overview. Um, the, uh, there's a question from, um, uh, I think we can go a few minutes over for some Q&A. Um, so Dylan uh, Berger is, uh, had a question about research overlap and the technical uh, variability that he outlined. I'll just read it out. Uh, he's asking with the increased attention and progressively lower cost for uh, single cell RNA sequencing, as well as the organoids, uh, we are likely to see similar, if not completely overlapping research questions. Uh, addressing the knowledge gaps. Is there value in this without first addressing the technical variability uh, that you outlined? You know, do we have the tools right now to consolidate the overlapping studies? Um, oh, in terms of integrating data sets? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, it's hard to it's hard to say. Like my my bioinformatics analyst right now is trying to integrate different data sets and uh, we are getting a lot of noise <laughs> in doing so. So I don't know if you're trying to integrate very early data sets, maybe that might affect things. Um, I think from certain sources like KPMP, where Matthias Kressler at Michigan is very, very meticulous about their protocols. Um, I think in terms of source, that might actually be a potential source where we could be more confident in those types of analyses. I think we do have to look at you know, the lab that's putting the data out there, really looking at their methods. And again, like the tissue dissociation part, that's not trivial. Uh, like my grad student on one day, she might get 30% viability in a dissociation and 85% on another day. And there's no way that that's not affecting things. Maybe there's a little less so if we do new single nuclear sequencing, just because the extract, those have been frozen. So maybe a little less variability there, but in terms of, um, but yeah, I think in terms of fresh studies, we have uh, some ways to go. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, and if there are any other questions, please unmute yourself or raise your hand and ask. Um, until then, I wanted to ask about, you know, how, how close are we? You said 2042. Uh, as a clinician, that's what uh, we are, like the sickle cell 
uh, stuff has been amazing, right? We thought it was so far off, and suddenly it happened. Um, do you see? I mean, and which so which diseases do you think in nephrology will we be first uh, uh, to tackle, and how soon? Uh, you know, what's your crystal ball say about how soon do you think? Uh, are we are we close, or is it uh, a long way off still? I think we are still a ways off. I think the the um, the stronger phenotype diseases. So like. You know, if we can get a handle on what FSGS and MCD are, uh, that spectrum, for example, um, if we can have a very clear histopathologic definition, so the correct phenotyping, and I know that's still an area of controversy, um, but theoretically in the very strong phenotype, I think that's where our first gains will be. And then when we get to things like diabetic nephropathy, well, we already have the flozinator, so we can <laughs> we buy ourselves some time. But I think on that end, I think the patient risk stratification piece, that part is probably where we're gonna see more. But in mm -hmm. terms of the more complex and heterogeneous phenotypes, the types of you know like genome editing, that type of stuff may not yield as much. But I think where we are closer to would be looking at, okay, if we are able to develop a risk score, should you be flozinated earlier? Should you be screened more closely? If, right. if, at least in the U, I don't know about Canada and the U.S., if we can have better access to primary care. Yeah, yeah, access is always an issue, and also the the um, the drug toxicity stuff is also cool, right? Rather than relying on um, animal data in, in mice or what have you, uh, that seems pretty promising. Like there are many different angles, of course, that one could uh, work on. Um, yeah, I would say like I think one area that's big that we need to get a better handle on is the uh, immunotherapy because mm -hmm. there's a lot of acute kidney injury from that. Another caveat to the organoids is that they don't have immune cells in there. Oh, okay. So that's one caveat. So that's a limitation, but for the classical chemo agents, or if you, know, if you are trying to decide between like, can this person handle gentamicin? Right. You know, maybe it'll be informative in that context. Okay, right, right, right. Yeah, it's not a real circulation, uh, so so there are no immune cells. I didn't realize that. Uh, so there's still a role for the old-fashioned yeah. stuff. Yeah, we were trying to we were trying to throw immune cells on our organoids and ended up killing our organoids, which I know was not supposed to happen. <laughs> so we're still a ways away in terms of that technology. Yeah. And, and uh, last question, if uh, anyone else isn't asking, is is about the technology, right? You showed how fast things moved, right? When you were undergrad and, you know, you were doing fellowship and suddenly things have changed. Is there something, you know, do you know anything else is in the horizon which will revolutionize the stuff again? Or I think it's pretty, it's getting pretty mature now and it's just figuring out the uh, the nitty gritty and the technical stuff. Oh, yeah. I don't know about other things in the pipeline. I think the spatial aspect mm -hmm. is be an area of intense focus because trying to study the uh, microenvironment and architecture of what's happening in cell-cell interactions. That is such a big part of any studying any organ, even tumors. So uh, that's, I'm pretty sure they're gonna get even better in doing multi-omics on to you know, a tissue slide, for example. Right. And especially if we're able to figure out how to do it with slides that have been banked in the freezer for 20 years. <laughs> yeah. Be, yeah. Yeah, that would be that would be awesome. So I think that's probably the next area where we're going to see an explosion. And we, I, if you caught Ben Humphrey's group, they have already been publishing some of their spatial transcriptomic data uh, in the past couple of months. So that's definitely something that we can look for NFJC wise. Whether or not we'll be doing a journal club discussion yeah. next this coming winter on the latest in spatial transcriptomics. I think that's an area of intense focus right now. Absolutely. It is, you know, it's, um, uh, I think there has been a focus on uh, epidemiology stuff. There's always a, uh, uh, you know, uh, interest and fashion, uh, but I think this is, there is so much going on in this space that it's an exciting time to be a, a physician scientist uh, in nephrology and otherwise also. Yeah, yeah. And I think also with OMIT's work and just um, the requirement that you share data. Mm -hmm. Um, and that you make it publicly available in order to get funding. Um, I think that's big in terms of changing the culture of 
people collaborating and mm -hmm. actually being more open with their data. And I think that's also helping to accelerate uh, uh, what we're developing and advancing for sure. Fantastic. So thanks again, Dr. Len, for presenting uh, to us. Uh, the, the recording will be uh, made available uh, on YouTube later on, um, probably tomorrow sometime.